Oh, hi there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. And this is episode number 334. That's 334. That's 334 with me, your host, Agostino. This is the Agostino Zinga Show. Before we continue, if you're watching this via YouTube, please make sure you hit subscribe, hit that like button, and leave me a comment down below if you uh, like what I'm talking about and you want to ask you some questions regarding the topics or you have any suggestions for future shows. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, leave me a five star review and share it with your family and friends. That's all I ask from you guys. God damn it. That's all I ask. I'm not asking for your hand in marriage. I'm not telling you to give me your hoodie, right? I'm not asking you to buy me a bleeding, you know, sausage and bean melt from Greg's. I'm only requesting that you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment, five star review, and share it with your friends. Not, not that much, right? It's only five or six instructions, but if you don't mind, that would be really, really helpful. Anyways, here we are, man. Here we are. Hope you guys are well. Hope you guys are good. I'm feeling amazing, feeling great, as you can tell by my mood and my voice. I'm feeling boisterous, I'm feeling loud, I'm feeling encouraged, I'm feeling optimistic, right, in the face of all this um, pandemonium going around the world, I feel good, and you know why, because I've been exercising regularly, right, that's been really helping me, man, I went to the little park thing I got next to my house, it's like a little freeway area, and you can go do like, you know, there's like a pull-up bar, there's like a weird climbing wall, there's a bit of grass you can do burpees on and, you know, make sure you don't, you know, uh, do any burpees on some on some uh, dog caca. But for the most part, it's a pretty well um, all encompassing um, unit or little zone that you can go and exercise. In. And I've been really enjoying my time there. Really have, man. And it reminded me and then it made me really sad that we haven't got gyms open at the moment. But I understand it's for the greater good. But honestly, man. Working out and being able to stretch your legs somewhat is really beneficial to your mental health, especially if we're going to go live in a in a post-COVID world, right? If we live in a world where, I don't know, let's say everyone works from home, right? Or some, or like from a co-working space or from like a satellite office. You come in, I don't know, let's say every other week <coughs> to, to meet with your international clients or some of your team members or to inspire your troops, whatever it may be. You're going to need some kind of... Um, exercise or some kind of um, stretching of the legs or some sort of outside activity that doesn't have to do with work that allows you to step outside your house you're gonna have to or we're gonna live in some weird dystonia dystopian world where you don't really go outside you see that a lot i saw actually mandy it reminds me kind of a minority report you know when they're going around in the cars no yeah minority is a good example when you watch those kind of movies that are set in the future they don't really have a lot of there's not a lot of scenes outside of people's homes and maybe their office where they work, where people are interacting in the streets. It's not really a thing. They always turn the streets into some weird Gotham looking bleak um, hellhole where no one wants to be outside because there's all these tramps that are going to come and rob you. Right. Excuse the term tramps. but That's what we call people in the UK who beg for money. Um, you know, whether they be your friend or whether they be someone outside of Morrison's, uh, it's the same term, but that's what you always see. Right. You always see like, a really dark and gloomy place. You don't really see people interacting like in a park or hanging out or going to a restaurant and sitting outside a cafe. It's always just really strange, dimly lit thing. Um, and that's quite harrowing. But if we get to a place where everyone's working from home, right, it could turn into that. We could just turn into these beings that just live in pods, right? We do all our workouts in front of a screen from our favorite IG influencer, you know, workout of the day, um, we pontificate online about the actions of social media celebrities who we hate to follow. Um, all these really weird things. So I think it's really beneficial. It's going to be really important that they work out a plan that allows gyms to reopen. Again, I'm I'm really baffled, because especially in the UK, we have bars opening on the weekend, which I'm excited about, right? It'd be good to go out and get a pint with a friend, hang out on the streets. But I didn't know that this reopening of the bars on the weekend, they're going to allow people to sit indoors. You're going to be able to sit inside the pubs. Which is really strange, isn't it? I would, I didn't think that was going to be a thing. I should have obviously um, understood that because I remember watching a video on the prior episode of the show from Isle of Wight or something, and they were maybe the first um, British Isles to um, ease the lockdown, and they had one pub where people were sitting down, you know, spaced out obviously um, to abide by the social distancing rules. But people were sitting down in the pub, and I think doing that in London is going to be, or in the UK in general, is going to be a pretty tall order. So I wouldn't be surprised if we end up um, all locking down again for a second time, like Leicester have. But if you can open the pubs and allow people to sit down and have a drink and hang out with their friends and have some dinner, then why can't you allow gyms with social distancing? It doesn't make any sense. Now, the gym that I go to, of course, I understand because, you know, there's hardly, if any, ent ventilation in there. 
uh, they can't open the windows. It's sort of like um, it's sort of like the same thing. It has the same sort of premise behind it, like a hotel where you can't really open the windows, just the air conditioning that works. Or if they can open the windows, it's a little vent on top of it. That's really annoying. And then the window acts as like a magnifying glass for heat, right? So you end up feeling really sticky, really hot, really humid, very very quickly into your workout. So I understand, you know. And plus, the researcher said. Um, if you're speaking loudly, if you're spitting, if you're perspirating, you can spread coronavirus a lot quicker. So I get it. I understand. But come on, man. I've not felt this good this whole lockdown since. Honestly, this is the best I've felt because I've just been going out to this little gym thing, doing some burpees, um, doing some push-ups, some little sit-ups, whatever, running, doing some pull-ups or attempting to do pull-ups and then coming home. And I felt so much better. So, um, yeah, man, let's... Uh, Let's hope that they are able to reopen the gyms pretty soon because I would be so thankful for it. My mind, my body and soul would be like my ankles are kind of were tensing up a little bit because I haven't been doing squats and working out in the gym and doing all my mobility stuff. Like it's just, yeah, it's a pain in the ass, man. Being this sedentary is not the way forward, honestly. It really isn't. Obviously, it would help if I just left my house more often. But, you know, before, if you go, if you go to the gym for an hour and then you walk to work, um, for 30 minutes and you come back to work from 30 minutes that's already like you know essentially two hours of movement not including the times you're going you know up and down from your chair at work you're leaving to go lunch or hanging out with your friends you do move quite often if you're if you want to you can be quite active especially for me I, I tend to walk back home if I happen to work like in the you know let's say like in a hipstery area Liverpool Street I walk back home on a Friday just for the fun of it so I would like it. I would like there to be more onus on trying to reintegrate or trying to educate the populace around living a more healthy lifestyle. I'm not going to go full Joe Rogan like, oh, people should have more vitamin D and all that stuff. But there is, there needs to be a conversation about, you know, this coronavirus has essentially, you know, savaged people with pre, uh, with um, what you call it, with pre-existing conditions, especially people who are obese, overweight, um, respiratory issues. It's really affected them a lot. And, you know, and if we know that there's one thing that can help with all that sort of stuff is, you know, living a fairly healthy, uh, balanced lifestyle can eliminate some of those um, effects, can kind of put you out of the equation. So that should be a conversation that should be had by some health officials, of course, not by me, because I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But come on, man, let's let's have some sort of conversation. Isn't it? Let's have some conversation. Anyway, let's move on to the show. So I'm thinking, right, first thing I want to do since lockdown, because lockdowns happen what? Ladies, easing on lockdown is on Saturday, the fourth, right? And I can't wait to get my trim. I can't wait to get a haircut. Like, um, I've never been the biggest, you know, I've never been the biggest um proponent of getting haircuts every week or every two weeks, like some of my friends in the ends do, right? They get their haircut sometimes every week, every Friday. There was a time they get it, but god damn, man, I've missed the feeling of having my scalp exposed on the sides, right? Um, I'm even considering cutting my beard, which is the thing I'm, I'm more um, concerned about. The haircut, I know I'm going to do. I'm going to definitely get what I have all the time is, a, you know, shave, fade the side. That's going to be really entertaining. But the major difference is going to be what I do with the top. And the top of my hair, I've been growing it for the best part, I don't know, of like four years. It's a lot longer than what it looks like because obviously I haven't I haven't braided it and this hasn't been uh, blow dry, not blow dry, is it steam, whatever, hot combed, whatever. So it's a lot longer, even if you, if you look at the camera, look how long that is, right? It's all that, it's all curled up and tangled up and it hasn't been combed and brushed in the ages. It looks like a bird's nest in there, if you can see that, right? There's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in there, probably some creatures hanging around, all right? A couple of whites, but that's all right, right? That gives me some character. But I really, really want to sort out the top. So I'm thinking about doing these... But I think they're called box braids, right? Let me go. The Louis Uzi Vert has them. So there's, there's two haircuts, right? They're both... It's either I go for the Louis Uzi Vert version of a of a trim or I go for the Playboy Carti. Let me see if I can get it up here. He's got braids, right? And then we go for the Playboy Carti. Playboy Carti hair, right? These are the two options to go for. And it's two versions of uh, facial hair too. So if I get the Uzi version of facial hair... I'm going to have to go for the kind of, you know, um, the lowered version of the beard I have at the moment. And if I go for the Playboy Carti, I'm going to have to go for the R&B little chin beard that I used to have back in the day. 
So these are the examples, right? And I'm saying I'm, I'm really thinking because I've always I've always put it off. It's been something I've always had to put off because I don't want to be sitting in between some girl's legs for four hours where she braids my hair. I just can't be bothered. And I'm I'm always under the assumption that I've got I'm so busy. I have so many things. I have so much to do. I got no time to waste. But you know I need to grow up, suck it up, and just sit down and get my hair braided because it needs to be done because it's gonna help my hair to grow better. It's going to obviously help it get more healthy i guess right you can help with breakage when they kind of hot comb it and whatever and, and apply all the ointments all that sort of stuff but i just need it to get done because you know it's going it's getting so long now that it just is un it's just un you know just doesn't look nice so first option we have here um little uzi verse braids right so he has these sort of braid things at the top which i'm going to show in the image if you're not watching via the podcast and like uh if you're not watching via youtube then i apologize but i'll describe this as i can so it's sort of like these uh braids he has on the top of his hair um which kind of look like cornrows essentially but you can get them in a twos you can get them in three sometimes i saw um little yeah actually had a uh, had it done as well recently because he's doesn't he doesn't really dye his hair as much as often as well but it really helps to hair, help your hair grow right so that's one option and of course you've got the classic kind of like dreadlocks that he's got there on top which i'm also considering to get but i'm thinking of getting that right so that's similar to what a, like a pop smoke r.i.p sort of haircut that he had but braids on the top with obviously um the classic sort of like r&b beard he hasn't got the r&b beard here at the moment but I think he's wearing that the he's wearing that the, the more I saw on his Instagram, but yeah, this is another one as well of the kind of braids that I'm looking to get at the moment. So that's what I'm planning to do, right? Get the braids on the top, and then hopefully um, hope that that kind of grows and becomes what it can. Then the second option is to go for the Playboy Carti locks, which I've considered doing, but I'm kind of worried because obviously if you get locks, you can't actually take locks out. You're gonna have to just cut your hair, so that's the problem. So I might just go for the Louis Vuitt. Um, braids first and then once I kind of get accustomed to seeing my head that way then kind of trans then kind of no once I get accustomed once my hair grows a little bit under the braids and gets a bit more healthy then I then take it out and then do the locks but I really want I've been wanting to get locks for ages but I just again can't be bothered not patient enough um, don't want to sit in between some girls legs and get it done but it's definitely something I think would suit me pretty well um, I would hope so right I've got a pretty big chrome big head right um, my hair is like what my head in terms of um new era size i'm like a seven five eights this is a huge head it's, it's quite close to like an eight in a new era so i'm not sure if this is going to look the way it should look on me but i'm hoping it does but i don't think it will right it's like when girls go it's like a, i remember one of my friends saying something similar like girls when they go to hair salons they always i think there was a time it might have been when friends was on <coughs> People wanted to get women wanted to get that those Jennifer Aniston curls, which I like, similar to like what the Fox News presenters have now, right? The Fox News anchor women, they have those sort of like, um, you know, is it are they called sausage curls? Whatever their curls are, that kind of lay down here and they're really plump and blown out and stuff, right? And really bright and shiny. So I remember, uh, I think it must have been Jennifer Aniston. She was obviously a style icon at, during, in that era when Sex and the City was. I'm not friends, sorry, Sex and the City. Um, it's Jennifer Aniston, right? It's Jennifer Aniston, Sex and the City. Um, is Jennifer Aniston or my friend, my friends? I don't know. It's one, one of them women. Doesn't matter. Um, one of those white ladies, a second seat woman or friends woman, and they wanted to. There was loads of girls going to his salon and kind of ask requesting that style, and then it had to be you know. And hairdressers were really like you know, were getting a bit down because they had to break the news to these middle-aged women that they couldn't actually get that hair. Because, you know, their head wasn't the same size, their hair didn't grow the same way, it didn't suit their facial structure, just different, you know, a whole bevy of things. Um, and that usually happens, obviously, in hair salons. But in barbershops, I feel like you should be you should be allowed to demand what you want to have done with your hair. But in some black barbershops, they still, especially the African guys, like, I don't know why, no. It happens across the board. Let me not let me not even try and do that. It happens all the time. Caribbean barbershops and African barbershops. I think the only one that hasn't done that to me, where they've not, just not listened to what I've said, is when I went to Barcelona and I had the opp had the opportunity to go to like a Dominican Republic barbershop there because it's quite a big Dominican Republic um, population and uh, all the barbershops are fucking sick. I just went into some random one and got a skin fade before I went to run the Barcelona half marathon and it was great. Don't get me wrong, my Spanish was a bit broken, but I told him what I wanted and he just did it and that was it. There was no like, oh, don't do this, don't do that. But where, which, I, which you find yourself doing a lot when you go to like a black barbershop in the UK. You find yourself having to like instruct somebody, hey, don't do that. I didn't tell you to, to put my triangle into a moustache, uh, my moustache into a triangle. Don't take off too much of the bit. Like you clearly said in the beginning, hey, 
give me level two on the beard. Don't take off too much in the bottom. Um, don't make it a triangle at the top of the mustache. And then they still do it, right? So it just gets it's just super annoying. So, but sometimes they can be right. Sometimes they can be looking at you thinking, hey, dude, you're not Playboy Carti. You got a really big head, right? And a massive chin. It's not going to work how you think it's going to work. Or they could look at me and say, oh, you're not Louis Uzi Vert and your head, you know, looks like a 50 pence piece underneath this, right? So maybe those braids won't work as well on you. I don't know. But I want to at least have the option to try. That's all I want. Give me the option to try. That's all I want. Give me the option to try. So let's see what happens. Um, coming up very soon, I will get the braids on top of my hair. I cannot wait. Um, so yeah, that's my thing that I'm looking forward to once lockdown is over. My trim. And just be able to sit down again in that chair, man. Talk to my barber. Have a bit of banter. Um, watch the boys inside the shop get, you know, have that kind of meerkat head or whatever. Any female form walks by the window. God damn it, man. If, you wanna, if you're a girl and you have some self-confidence issues, walk past a barber shop. I implore you. If you think you're having a bit of an ugly day, oh, I look fat today. Oh, I look so bloated. Oh, my bubble of big in this. Uh. If you have all those kind of, you know, self confidence issues that you're not, you don't really want to put out on the internet, you don't want to put a first trap out there to like get people to give you any sort of approval, but you want to feel good about yourself, I dare you to go walk past a barbershop on your way to go get some eggs and wear the most frumpiest outfit you can find. Wear like some bag battered jogging bottoms, a really holy t shirt, your mismatched socks, crappy sandals sandals no makeup and you will feel like beyonce right you'll feel like beyonce you'll feel like beyonce on a coachella performance you'll feel flipping lit you will because barbershop boys god damn it man anything as a female form they are mere catting <laughs> and i remember once right because i used to always get annoyed by it. i was thinking oh these guys man it's so uncouth uh, man i was like no hold on let me play this game right L let me get involved in them so i took out my headphones one day put down my phone and you know taking part in the conversation and i was like hold on let me just take a look at gander who these ladies are that walking by this barbershop that are getting my barbershop um peers barbershop friends yeah barbershop colleagues so hot and flustered let me see these women let me see what we're working with when i looked don't get me wrong they, they weren't you know they weren't ogres but i'm not gonna say they were rihanna right they were just regular girls walking by the shop and they made them feel like a million bucks i was like god damn it man the amount of attention mediocre women get compared to mediocre men is just like insane isn't it really it's insane no wonder some men when they get famous they just can't handle the amount of attention they get from women because they're just not used to it I think women have had the experience from, I don't know, it's bad as well because, you know, I'm for sure women have probably been sexualized a lot younger than guys to, um, have been. But God damn it, man. Women are so used to having a male attention, like constantly bestowed upon them for like, you know, weeks, and months and years, right? Before they eat, they reach any kind of maturity that they, when they do reach a mature age, they're able just to kind of fend it off and uh, get out of here, right? Like girls in the ends, there is no such thing as like, you know, misogyny in girl, with girls in the ends because they'll punch you right in the face. Do you know what I mean? They're not playing around here, right? They don't play with this all like, ah, I'm my safe space. They'll kick you in the nuts. So they've been trained by the amount of animals that they have to kind of, you know, sort away as they're going to work. I remember one time in a, on a train when I was, yeah, this is like, might have been a couple of months ago. No, not a couple, no, no, more than a couple of months ago. I was on the central line on the way to work and some girl, some like Asian girl was standing next to me and she kept like, like, you know, breathing. I was like, mm, I didn't know what was going on. I thought at first, I thought I was too close. I thought my bag was I like, bumping into. I don't know what was happening because it was literally just sitting, standing right in front of me. Then I noticed one guy who happened to be again an Asian dude happened to be like grinding up against her. Like whenever the, tra the, the train would move in the central line, because you know, if you know anything about the central line during peak hours, um, you know it's super packed, and especially between like let's say anywhere anywhere up until Oxford Street, it's like ramo jammer. And every time the train kind of like accelerated, it, it kind of moves, it jolts, and you swing back and forth, he'd rub up against her. Anytime it was about to stop, he'd rub up against her. When the doors closed, he'd rub up against her. When it started again, he'd rub up against her. Like every opportunity was using it. So she kept panning about that. And then finally, she just had enough. And she just stopped and said, would you... And, and then she perfectly timed it, right? When the train kind of doors closed, it kind of creases away from the doors. It closes. Then it starts going again and there's a silent bit. There's like a silence where you can hear everybody. And she said, would you stop fucking coming close to me or touching me? Something along those lines, right? Get away from me, you fucking crib. Something like that really loud, super loud. 
so loud that once the doors opened, the guy like slipped away like a, like a thief in the night. He just disappeared from the train. But it was so embarrassing. I was like, I felt so embarrassed for the guy. But then he looked at him and he was like, okay, he deserves it. He looked like a bit of a creep. I mean, he looked like he'd be sitting down with, what's his name? Chris Hansen or whatever. Is this Chris Hansen? Right, that guy, right? To catch a predator. He looked that kind of dude. But again, that's from ENDS. That's a girl from ENDS, right? She's been, she's, she's had to, she's been exposed to so many douchebags in her life that she has no patience for this rubbish, right? You're not going to rub your, your flipping flaccid penis up against my skirt as I'm going to work. Like, get your stinky, crusty hands off of me. Um, which is amazing. But guys, regardless of ends, don't get that <laughs> at all. We don't get that training because no one's looking at you. If you're like a... I'd imagine if you're like an, a, a, a seven under, you've probably never received any positive reaffirmation from the this opposite sex ever in your life, really. Like, you've never been in Tesco's and some girls look to you like, oh, he's, he's quite tasty. You probably haven't, right? So when you get any kind of celebrity and you get a bit of fame and you have people creeping into your DMs or you have people looking at you favorably because you have a bit of fame, you probably can't handle yourself. It's just, it, I, I'm not surprised that there's so many issues with guys in careers such as like comedy and stuff, right? Because realistically, to make it as a stand-up comedian, you have to be in the industry for what? You have to be grafting from what? Maybe 10 years plus, right? In the arts, I'd say most of the time in the arts specifically, whether you're a contemporary paint, whether you're a contemporary artist, a musician, a DJ, a stand up comedian, a theatre act, you, yeah, you, you work in theatre, you're an actress, whatever, an actor, sorry, you're a playwright, uh, you're a writer on a show. You probably have to be grinding a minimum of five years behind the scenes, toiling away, working in, rub in rubbish, you know. Um, in rubbish kind of nine to five jobs to kind of pay your way forward while you should do your, you know, your, the thing that you really want to do outside of work, right? And then you suddenly pop and you're like, what, 28 years old plus? And you've probably had, let's say, three girlfriends in your life, maybe a couple of one night stands. And then suddenly you have like girls who you never would have have a, had a chance of attaining prior to your fame now reaching up to you. No wonder you're going to act out. No wonder. Honestly, no wonder you're going to act out. Especially, you know, in an environment where you're you're kind of treated like, a, you're, you're kind of infantilized as well, right? When you're a celebrity and you're working in the entertainment industry, you, you're sort of given a license to be a bit Peter Panish, right? Um, it's just, It suspends belief and it suspends your age. Your age kind of gets paused for a little bit when you're in the entertainment industry. People tend to age, like, you know, in two-year increments, right? Um, for the most part. But I don't know, man. I don't know why I started rambling about that. But hey, let's move on to something else. <laughs> um, I can't wait to get my hair cut. That's the main thing. But let's move on. What's the next thing to want to get into? That falls of interest. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, let's talk about this. Briefly. The problem with letting go of Angel Gomez. So, um, on the football front, don't talk about much football on here because, you know, it can get a bit boring. But touching on it because it's May United and I can talk about what I want. Angel Gomez, one of um, our recent academy graduates, somebody who kind of burst through the scenes in the reserves and uh, playing with the end of 23s, it, it looks like he's going to be let go by Manchester United. Olegan Sosha gave a press conference the other day, essentially said he hasn't signed a new contract and the you know the date for signing contracts is good. I think it's going to be tomorrow, Wednesday, right? Um, everything has to be signed by Wednesday. If not, then uh, players that are out of contract will be allowed to leave and seek pastures new. Now, Angel Gomez is an interesting case study because he's obviously a player. I'm going to put the video here in the background so you can see what people are talking about. This is a kind of a little skip from. I'll mute the sounds of no one so I don't get banned or anything. But Angel Gomez is an interesting one, uh, just because you know I think he is. A player who might have suffered the most post-SAF, maybe, in that regard. Because they're so mediocre and because he's so tiny but good. <laughs> maybe there was a case for when Solskjaer came in, he had to kind of rely on players that he knew could kind of withstand, who were robust, right? That were able to maybe play, I don't know, three games in a week in the Premier League, European Cups, domestic Cups, whatever it may be. That might be part of it. Or it just simply might be the case that he's a young player who fought a lot of himself, went to negotiate a better contract. And um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and the club management fought against it. But I'm also kind of... Uh, I'm also left thinking maybe he wouldn't have left if we had a director of football because it looks like we're never going to get one, right? I think Edward was sort of like essentially said that he's kind of put the blame, he's kind of laid the blame or kind of give the responsibility to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and his sort of advisors and the people that he kind of has um, the ear of who are kind of advising him on transfers. But I think if we had a director of football who was able to orchestrate 
um, our approach to recruitment, our playing style, not playing style, our approach to recruitment, um, the kind of football we wanted to play going forward, the kind of player we were kind of profiling, I think we would probably have held um, Angel Gomez closer to our chest than, pre, than what is basically happening at the moment. Because you look at someone like Angel Gomez, you think that profile of player who could essentially kind of re replace matter in this sort of role, right? Um, who kind of come through the academy, doesn't really cost us much. You're going to have to spend a minimum of 50 million to replace that kind of player anyway, even if it's a Jack Grealish, whatever it may be, right? And you're having to risk the... Then there's a risk, obviously, included of like not knowing if that person's actually going to perform on your in your team, right? You look at someone like a Morgan Schleiderman, right? A good, good example. Played for Southampton, played for... Southampton, who else was it before? Somebody else before. I've got a team. But anyway, he spent a lot of time in the Premier League. He was very accustomed to the league, very accustomed to what we were about. Came to Man United and completely stunk up the place. So it goes to show that just because you've got Premier League experience doesn't mean you're going to be a success in a team. So I look at Andrew Gomez and think to myself, I would have probably given him more of a chance to kind of prove his worth, especially when you think of the amount of chances Cheech Chong was given. You can argue and say, oh, but Cheech Chong signed his contract. It doesn't matter. I think if you have good players, talented players, you should play them, right? Regardless if they sign a contract or not. Even if you, even if you want to let them go, you should probably play them so that they can look good so that you can kind of put them in a shop window, quote unquote, and they can, they can leave. We did the same thing with Alexis Sanchez, right? He was stinking up the place, but he kept on playing because we wanted to move him on. So I think the same could have been applied to Angel Gomez. And I don't think it's encouraging bad behavior either because if I, I like what Oli Khan Solskjaer is doing. I like the fact that he's kind of holding firm with the contracts and you know he's kind of instilling this idea that uh, players need to play for the badge and need to be committed to the project, blah, 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 blah. But he also needs to kind of accept that we don't, we're not in that era anymore where people, apart from maybe Real Madrid or whatever it may be, there's not many many players out there who really long for playing for a certain club these players are mostly in it for the money are mostly in it for the sporting accolades right achievements like kind of want to collect trophies like Ibrahimovic has done in his career but they're not necessarily tied or tethered to a club they're not really and if, again unless it's like Real Madrid or Barcelona for the most part most players just want to play football get paid win trophies which is okay but I think this idea that we should expect every academy graduate to be you know Mark Hughes in you know in the in their loyalty or but yeah mark hughes yeah mark hughes in their loyalty and devotion to the club is really really short-sighted i think in that regard and i think again we've we just kind of it's one of those missteps that we always end up doing as my united as a club in general we always end up letting go of players who have a lot of potential like a you know a daily blind uh i can't think who's the other one uh a memphis the pie we end up looking, look, letting go of those players sooner than we let go of actual certified crap, right? Phil Jones being a good example. He's How long has he been out of our club? How long has he stunk up the place? How long has he basically proven he's not fit um, physically and mentally to play at this level, right? He's still here. Andres Pereira has been given countless opportunities, but he always flatters to deceive. Um, you know, Lingard has, unfortunately for me as well, because I'm a big fan of Lingard's and it's been really um, heartbreaking to see how far he's fallen, but he's obviously not going to get any better anytime soon. There are players who have quite clearly been given a lot more chances than Gomez to impress or to keep their place and they haven't necessarily taken it. So I don't really see why we're being so cutthroat with a kid that's only 19. Um, that's the thing that really disturbs me in that regard. Like I would much rather prefer a little bit more patience there. But again, if there's no patience there, but then there's uh, an acceptance that we need to get to the top as soon as possible and we go out and sign a Greedish, we go out and sign a sound Niguez or whatever, fair enough, right? I understand that, fair. But I want to see that intent going forward in the summer market. Again, we're not going to see it until the season's over, but something tells me that it's not going to work out the way we think it's going to work out. I think we end up signing one player and then that will be our lot. We end up having just kind of hang hang on and deal with that. When you look at the second team I played against Norwich and you think to yourself, we need more than one player to kind of make us a title challenger again. But again, what do I know? Man? Maybe I don't know any different. Um, but yeah, wishing Angel Gomez all the success. Hopefully he goes on to prove us wrong. Um, I would actually like that for his career in general. I think it's good. It's not, not even to stick one up to Oli. I just think it's good to see our players, even when they do leave, go and make a success of themselves and have a solid career. I looked at Ryan Tunnicliffe the other day. He's playing for, like, is it Burnley or Barnsley? One of them, right? And he's doing pretty well over there. It's nice to see those young players who have come through, didn't really cut it at our level, still be able to kind of support their family, live their dreams, playing you know, at the top level. That's the dream, really, in the end of the day. It doesn't matter how far down you fall, quote unquote. As long as you're playing professional football, you've won. So, yeah, so um, big up Andrew Gomez. Hopefully, he goes on to doing some great things and you know we're able to kind of claim as ones our own in it because he did come through our academy but anyway moving on boss is on the list here let me get rid of this uh moving on 
we have to talk about Lena Dunham and nepotism because I think this is annoying and pisses me off. So it seems like it's it appears as if Black Lives Matter has morphed into yeah the protest against police brutality following the killing of George Floyd which led to a resurgence or revival of Black Lives Matter, which then has led to some weird form where now we have black people on social media essentially um, trying to push for, I don't know, occupational uh, re re reparation, reparations in that regard. Does that make sense? Employment reparations, right? They're essentially going after industries and areas where they feel as if they've been overlooked and trying to readjust the balance by getting white people fired or by raising questions about white people's um, worth in that field so that they can replace them, right? This is what essentially is morphed into, which is really, really dangerous. But we should have seen the writing on the wall um, as soon as people were talking about equality of outcome, right? Not equality of opportunity, which is what most people should be pushing for. And in my opinion, I think it's a real missed opportunity because I think... The killing of George Floyd was, you know, it's terrible, right? Really, really terrible. Super gruesome. I think about that video so many times randomly, right? I'll be in the kitchen making something to eat and just pop in my head, just picturing him lying on the floor and essentially having his life squeezed out from him, right? It's just utterly horrifying to think about. But it's one of the most unique situations because, you know, we've seen so many videos of police brutality all over the world, especially in America. And none, no other video has was have managed to galvanize the entire world. For once, right? We never had it happen. We always had the thing of like a police brutality video happens and then you get people on the right trying to explain away why what we're seeing isn't what we're seeing. At the moment, the only person we've got really out there who's really against George Floyd and kind of, you know, kind of butting against the narrative is Candace Owens, right? She essentially is basically saying that we shouldn't be making him out to be a martyr. Um, he might have died, um, he might have died via the hands of a cop, but he got himself in trouble in the first place. He was a bad guy. He was a drag addict. You know, that's what it kind of, she's the only person I've seen so far that's been going ham and saying that, you know, what we're seeing isn't real. But most people, regardless of how far right they are or how, how conservative they may be in their views they can agree that okay that was unjust so it was a really rare opportunity to really galvanize everybody in an effort to kind of push against um this uh i don't know to push against the how society is sort of structured at the moment right between the haves and the haves not especially in terms of equality of opportunity not outcome opportunity because i think most people that's what they suffer from they suffer from the opportunity of not being given a chance to prove their worth and i think i always attribute this to football because growing up when we used to try and play there's a lot of people in my ends who are really good at football right who probably could have gone on to become professionals but you know through luck of the draw injuries just getting caught up in the lifestyle you know on the streets and whatever it may be they kind of fell by the wayside but a common mantra we had back in the day when we used to play football in a cage was we just wanted the opportunity. We all kind of played our guts out so that, you know, in the in the hopes in the back of our head that if Arsene Wenger's taxi happened to like break down next to the cage while we were playing, he'd see how talented we are and give us a chance to play, right? That's what we wanted. You just wanted the opportunity. But you understood that you were as good as everybody else you saw on TV, but they had the chance to play in front of somebody that was a decision maker, a shot caller, a gatekeeper, who then were able to like, hey, they kind of gave you the blessing and you were kind of ushered in because we also understood as well, like uh, Ryan Tunnicliffe is a good example. I keep mentioning him. But um, once you become a professional footballer, it's very difficult for you to then suddenly not become, not be one later on down the line. Even if you, even if you fall really, really down the kind of football pyramid, you're still going to be able to support yourself and your family by playing football. That's the beauty of going into an industry. And most of the things, I think you even see it with the Kim Kardashian deal recently with this Kim Kardashian signed a, a deal where she's selling a part of her company to Coty, right? We see that because that's a good example of like, you know, the rich getting richer because once you're able to have some level of fame, some level of exposure, um, some level of success in your business, it just attracts more business to you because people see the value that you can bring to their brand and they want to be associated with it. It's just what it is. So I think the killing of George Floyd was a real opportunity to galvanize a people to um, push for equality of opportunity, to make, I don't know, to enact policies, um, to change hiring processes, something that was that was going to be sufficient enough to enable people to actually be put into a position where they can make decisions that would benefit their particular racial group, their particular interest group, whatever it may be, however kind of twisted and scented it may be, that was what was really important. This sniping at people like Leonard Dunham and saying, oh, she shouldn't have the position because her show's shit and she's mediocre and white 
isn't constructive it really isn't because who cares and there's so many nuances that are attracted that kind of attribute to somebody's successes to just reduce it down to race is really reductive and extremely naive and um this screenshot kind of proves it as much this is from pop crave it's a really good um twitter profile i recommend you check out loads of populated news but just kind of you know um, general mainstream stuff but some good points that you can kind of some a good it gives you a good overview of what's actually going on in a sort of like lamestream general media sort of uh, avenue so um this was kind of spurned by this tweet that went viral uh on the left of the screen here by a guy called um ahmed best right who took a screenshot of a hollywood reporter article from 2017 where which goes to show the amount of victory of some of these people in this movement or in general, at this t current time, have an anger they have towards the system and the industry. It's palpable and it's real, but I think it's misdirected. It shouldn't be directed towards the individuals. It should be directed towards the institutions that allow for Linda to come through and just in your pitch meeting to have a half done script and get, you know, and become as successful as she is. That's the issue. Not so much herself, because she might be mercurial. She might be super talented. She could probably be, she might be in a one percentile that's able to get away with doing a one pager of a script and still have a show. That's something you have to kind of, you know, suck up and realize that might be the case. But um, so anyway, the, the tweet that went viral was this Ahmed guy basically quote tweeted a Hollywood reporter tweet that says the following. Lennon Dunham was 23 years old when she sold girls to HBO with a page and a half long pitch without character, nor plot. So back in 2017, this would have been an inspirational message in some regard, right? People would have seen that and said, oh my God, wow, that's so cool. As long as you get yourself, in the as long as you get yourself through that door, as long as you're in that room, anything can happen, which is true, right? Which is why people, you know, which is why the whole term of elevator pitch is, you know, is popularized or is glamorized. The idea is that you might bump into Jeff Bezos in an elevator and you've got five minutes or less than to convince him that your idea is worth investing in. And suddenly, um, you know, through luck or through whatever it may be, your life has completely changed via the you know 30 second pitch able to deliver to jeff bezos and lift that's the thing but we're obviously under we obviously have um all collectively understood that it's more what's more important isn't that you're white or isn't that you're black the most important thing is that you're able to get inside that lift to be with jeff bezos in the first place which allows you know which is takes a lot so that's what the problem is structurally but then Ahmed um, Best quotes tweets it and says, oh, I have a master's degree in film and teach film at top tier university and an over 25 year professional career. And I walk into pitches with a fully realized Bible pilot and seven seasons arc. And oftentimes I'm told, no, it's not enough. But Leonard Dunham, cool. So essentially he's attributing the reason why he hasn't been successful to um, Leonard Dunham's success basically down to race, which is really um, disingenuous because he knows that's not true because, you know, there might be this thing that you have to kind of fess up, especially when it comes to the arts. I'm, I don't know. I really get sensitive about it because I think people get, when it comes to the creative industries, everyone everyone that works in that in in that space, you are aware for some in some way, shape, or form. You have to be aware that the job you're doing is pretty meaningless, right? For the most part, right? Anyone could replace you. Um, there's a kid probably out there who's drawing better than who's kind of illustrating at the moment much better than you are but he doesn't have any following he's got 10 twitter for 10 instagram followers no one cares about what he's doing but he's incredibly talented there's a girl out there writing amazing scripts no one listens to what she's doing there's a guy out there who's really funny in a podcast no one listens to what he's saying there are people out there who are doing just as good as you are but you have the privilege and you have the opportunity to kind of have the platform that you have the exposure blah blah blah, blah to amplify your voice which is great but you're not under the, the illusion that you're somehow better than everybody else. That's why you're in that position. It's kind of like a, it's kind of a hard thing to quantify, right? It's a little bit of talent. It's a little bit of hard work, perseverance, connection, network, um, timing. But there's a lot that goes into making you successful in the creative field. It's not just a matter of, oh, I'm white. Oh, I've got connections. Oh, my parents are rich. If that was the case, then we would have a lot more mediocre TV shows on at the moment than are really on TV. That's Let's be let's be real about this and it also raises an ugly question or an unfortunate question that people don't really want to fess up to you may have to look yourself in the mirror and think maybe i'm just not good enough maybe the free market decided that even if i maybe my bible pilot which this guy said he wrote seven seasons of a show that a network didn't want to pick up maybe me writing seven seasons isn't as good as Lennon dunham writing one that could be an actual thing or it might be the case that back when girls, again, and I'm not even a big fan of Lennon Dunham herself, right? I think she's an absolute donkey, right? In general, right? I think she's an absolute oaf. I've never been a fan of girls. I thought it was shit when it first came out. I maybe artistically or creatively appreciated the first two seasons, but I thought the premise behind these characters being people that 
girls kind of looked up to or had friends or were in any way believable was really disgusting and really you know far-fetched and missed the mark but again i'm a dude what the hell do i know and considering its success it obviously resonated with a large majority of people now at that moment at that time that aesthetic of girls and what it was about and the fact that Lena Dunn was, I don't know what, she she did this web series that I remember being really big at the time, right? She was spoken about and really in, in a lot of ways the same way Childish Gambino was, right? Like a few years back when everyone was sort of like heralding him as a savant. Um, that's what she was kind of riding off the back of and it was evident that she was actually very talented. She knew what she was doing when it came to writing um, for TV shows, writing these movies, writing scripts, uh, crafting characters. She has a, obviously a knack and ability, a flair for somehow synthesizing, you know, that sort of like yuppie, hipstery, whatever thing that was going on in those kind of, in that early 2000s era when Girls was on. It was a very much a reflection of the times, very much a reflection of her peer group, of that scene. No one can deny that. Um, so to, to, to suggest that somehow her success was only because of race is dumb because it's like the Sopranos. Sopranos, you know, was a success when it came out because it might have been during a time when, you know, mob movies were really in. And this guy comes along with this, t you know, amazing script, um, you know, which led to the Sopranos and then he gets greenlit and suddenly it becomes a success. But it's not because, you know, the guy happened to be, I don't know, connected to this um, a TV executive, this person that it gets a success. It might just be purely based on talent and timing. And I think that is real conversation. And I think sometimes, you know, I don't know, I just feel as if like this reparations that's going on at the moment with careers and with opportunity and with not with, with outcomes is really missing the mark because there is a real need to readjust the balance as to why maybe an Ahmed Best isn't, you know, in the rooms when it comes to the making decisions on what gets green lit so that he can maybe you know lend an ear push for a certain type of programming to be you know put onto those networks but it also has to be accepted that you know, let's say you do all the cultural racial um adjustments that need to be done right you get you know 50 50 parity in terms of you know black and white shows on tv you reduce it to just that right and then, you know, people vote for, vote with their eyes and then with their remote controls and say, no, nah, we don't want the black stuff. And the black stuff gets really low ratings and you just watch all the white stuff. What happens then? Do you, do you then suggest that somehow people need to be retrained at what they like and don't like? Then we get into some really murky waters. So I just think what we should be aiming for is a quality of opportunity. Give everybody a chance. Everybody should be able to have a chance to pitch a show if you have the talent, you have the ability, you have the word rule, you have the determination the drive to follow through on a script to write something you know i've got a blog and i don't even update that i know how hard to write is right writing is difficult it's not a fun job and again it's not something that everyone will want to do but if you want to get into that arduous task of writing and putting together a script putting together a show a pilot you should have the chance to pitch it to somebody that can decide whether or not this thing is green to go on tv that's the most you should be given outcome and you know to to be kind of given this kind of to be given um a show basically based on your color of your skin only for them for your show to get completely dumped after the first eight episodes because no one's watching it it's going to do a lot more damage and good for you and for the cause going forward so yeah i just don't know what how beneficial this is and another tweet again that's kind of you know ragging on Leonard Dunham saying and it turned out great it says here uh, risks are inherent to Hollywood ec ecosystem it's how networks and executives stand out and set themselves apart it says the problem is black creatives don't get these kinds of opportunities to prove themselves somehow the standards uh, of the unproven are skewed which is true that's what I, I agree with the Kendall lady on the, on, the, on the side here Kendall Jamal we need to give everybody opportunity, which kind of goes back to the old DJ thing I was talking about the other day, right? About, you know, this um, work Twitter, work techno Twitter sort of like on a rampage to essentially readdress the balances on lineups. I don't know, man. I don't know if that's the right way to go about it. Maybe we just need to get to a point. Maybe it's just, maybe it's not even a conversation to be had um, in front of the camera. It's something to be done behind the scenes. Like for instance, if let's say Berkine is the leader, right? Let's say Berkine is sort of like the industry leader. Everyone kind of follows their lead. Um, they closed their club i think the earliest in berlin right or the first to close um when uh, coronavirus broke out they kind of took the lead on that regard um essentially took down website which kind of you know has a list of all the victims of police brutality and, and charities you can kind of donate to so they were really forward with kind of addressing what was going on socially now let's say behind the scenes Bergheim don't make any announcements in front of camera but behind the scenes they uh commit to having their lineup be 20 percent represented by minorities or pocs whatever you say and then maybe 50 percent uh women that readdresses the balance immediately right 
But then it also has a problem of like, what pool are you pull, what pool are you pulling from? Are you just pulling shit people to represent people f- of minorities and just to kind of take the quota box, or are you going for the best of the best? And if it's the best of the best, that's great because then it inspires people from within that you know racial demographic to be like, okay, cool, someone looks like me is doing that thing and they're really good. I'm gonna go do it too. Whereas if you get someone that's mediocre, like what's happening with Virgil, right? You have like a a, a sort of like a you know whatever a mediocre designer who works really hard and has really good connections who's able to kind of craft this amazing career for himself but everything that he does it just doesn't really hit the mark it can inspire some people to be like oh wow if he can do it, i can but it also can build resentment in the sec in the group that you're trying to really inspire right where they can be like oh my god it's a particular kind of black person and it, that gets that job right it just perpetuates this cyclical you know eating of ourselves which is really harmful which is why i think we shouldn't really focus on the economy e- um, equality of outcome we should focus on equal equality of opportunity everyone should have the chance to prove themselves to have the opportunity to get that job to get that gig to get that placement to get that internship and then I think it will be better for everybody going forward. But I'm not, I'm not liking this revisionist history of like, oh, Lennon Dunham was never good. She was never talented. No, she was. You might not like her show. Like, I didn't like her show. I wasn't necessarily a fan of it. But you can't deny that she wasn't able to expertly kind of um, synthesize what was going on during that time and somehow be able to kind of put that on camera. Come on, man. Let's, let's not say that. Move on. Let's see what else is going to talk about here. Go to the screen. Airbnb founder says that travel will never be the same. We should have known this, but yeah, travel will never be the same. Travel will never be the same. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I think we've all come to a realization that, or I think some people have, some people haven't, some people are still kind of, you know, holding on to this idea that somehow, maybe you should have had that think, you should have maybe, you would have been allowed to think like that. You, I have more sympathy for you in March, right? When it kind of felt as if like, oh yeah, it's just going to be a couple of more weeks and then we'll go back to normal. But it's been six months already effectively, right? Um, of continual disruption. I'd say that because, you know, we heard of COVID, I was aware of COVID from January, right? And then by February, March, places were already starting to lock down. So it's been with us for a while and it's like, you know, we're essentially going into the second half of 2020 and it doesn't look like anywhere in the Western Hemisphere is going to go back to normal anytime soon. So we have to kind of put ourselves we have to kind of come to realization that we're going to live in a far in a much in a different world than what we're used to prior right things are going to be changed for the better i guess i'm a big fan of what i'm seeing at the moment with bars and club culture i think for the most part or bar culture for the most part i think allowing some bars to allow people to stand outside in the front carry drinks around with them is really good um it's going to maybe um allow people to communicate more hang out more maybe turn it into a bit more of a metropolitan vibe where people just hold up inside in some sweaty carpet filled pub somewhere that's a good thing um i think the idea that people go and shop now People aren't going to shop frivolously, right? Before the frivolous kind of shop to go pick up a pack of crisps isn't the thing. You go and do your weekly shop so you can minimize the amount of time you're spending in a shop in a supermarket surrounded by loads of people. You go, you you know, you do your weekly shop. You leave. You come. You come back out again. Um, that's pretty cool. And just maybe the saving of the money, right? Not being so uh, materialistic and you know essentially drowning yourselves in uh, retail therapy in order to kind of you know could distract yourself from your problems. That's a good thing. But the travel industry is one that's really going to suffer, isn't it? Going forward, you can definitely see that not really being the same again, um, especially when it comes to traveling to parts of like Southeast Asia. They've suffered a damage in reputation that's probably going to be felt for decades to come in it in terms of repairing um, the image of China, for instance, right? To the outside world is going to be very, very difficult. So they're going to have to do a lot of work in ensuring, you know, tourism um, comes back to China in some way, shape or form. And obviously Airbnb um, plays a really integral part in people's travel arrangements. You know, I've used it for the best part of, you know, I don't know, five years or so or maybe more um and they've done a lot of cuts at the moment i think they've fired you know let go of a few people from different offices around the world and essentially the ceo has been um or the founder has been really candid about the prospects of airbnb going forward and he kind of detailed this in this sort of post i got here at the moment from axios it's titled airbnb ceo travel may never be the same i'll read a couple of paragraphs to you now um, I'll link the article in the show notes. It says the following. Um, Airbnb co-founder Brian Chesky told Axios in an interview that global travel may never be may never fully recover, that he sees a future where people travel much more within their own countries, possibly for longer stays. He says, 
driving the news. I will go on the record to say that travel will never, ever go back to the way it was pre-COVID. It just won't. Chesky told us via Zoom from his home in San Francisco. There are sometimes months when decades of transportation happens. No, there are sometimes months when decades of transformation happen, which is true. Um, I think I've, I've said that already. I think we, I'm, we're, I'm kind of, you're kind of seeing it happen. You saw it happen maybe post-lockdown. A lot of people kind of escaped from the busy cities to go and you know live in their townhouse outside of the city in the countryside somewhere or to go and stay with family that live in a smaller town or to go and rent an airbnb somewhere i've, I've heard of people doing that in the states especially they've rent now an airbnb in the middle of the woods with a couple of friends to kind of connect with nature uh, become one with oneself do some exercise chill meditate relax just kind of unplug that's the thing now, I think that person or that group of friends that God does that, it's very unlikely you're going to have that experience of spending a prolonged period of time in the woods, having that experience of being connected with nature and then come back to civilization and just be okay with, you know, getting on the packed train somewhere. It's going to change something about the way you approach life in general. And it should obviously approach, def it definitely will change the way you approach holidays. Because I think there was a thing, I think I remember this being a conversation I had with a few friends where there was this idea that wanderlust, being, being able to travel further and to go to you know many more countries than your friends was somehow a bat was like a badge of honor right and that was the only way to enjoy your holidays was to go to like a far-flung place somewhere um the further the better the more luxurious the better but i think lockdown what it's basically done is it's concentrated it's basically told us to recalibrate or to maybe uh yeah to recalibrate what we kind of value right and it's really made us focus on what we actually want out of life. And most people, once lockdown's over, aren't necessarily longing to go to the pub, aren't necessarily longing to go buy a jacket from Zara. What they actually want is to be able to go and hug their friends, kiss their mum on the cheek, um, you know, um, whatever, right? Go to a club somewhere, go to a gig, watch a movie in the cinema. That's all they want. They don't really, they're not bothered about going to Ibiza. They're not bothered about going out, hanging out in some weird place somewhere, right? They just want to go and connect with their friends. So I think that appreciation, that level of kind of sentiment, is something that's going to last. I think I don't think it's just going to go back to normal. People are just going to be like, ah, whatever, fuck it, I don't really give a shit. It's going to last going forward. So I think that's a really, really good thing. Um, but it's definitely going to affect travel. That's going to make people think, you know what? I don't need to go to a far from place to have some. Um, alone friendship time with my friends we can go and rent an amazing house somewhere in the middle of devon you know bring some drinks play some music and hang out and have just as much fun we don't need to go to barcelona we don't need to go to you know thailand we don't need to go to brazil to do these things you can just do it all locally and i've always think that's gonna i've always had this assumption that's going to change because a lot of my friends in my social circle are moving out of london and going to different places parts of the uk which would have never happened pre-covid Pre-COVID, everyone was talking about going to Berlin, right? Going to go live in, I don't know, in Georgia. Going to go live in Paris. Going to go live in Madrid and whatever it may be, right? But now people are like, you know what? I don't really need that. I just need to go live somewhere that's a little bit low-key, that maybe is a bit more dialed down, a little bit more of a slower pace of life, just so I can kind of connect and get back to what I actually love. So it continues. It says here, um, Chesky says... Um, he said... Um, Chesky, who said travel has changed um, more tectonically... Then during the Great Recession of 2018, 2008 story, said Airbnb data shows these trends. He says, people are not getting on airplanes. They're not crossing borders. They're not meaningfully traveling to cities. They're not traveling for businesses. They're getting in cars. They're traveling to communities that are 200 miles away or less. That are usually very small communities. They're staying in homes and they're staying longer, which is you've seen happening. I've mentioned it. A few people have rented that um, Airbnbs and, you know, in little town, in little countryside somewhere for a long, pretty long period of times just to kind of go and reconnect. You can Continues here, it says, Airbnb says business within countries has recovered to previous levels, but international travel remains off in a way that's devastating to the platform. He says, people one day get back to, people want, people will one day get back on planes, Chesky said. But on the things, but one of the things that I do think is a fairly permanent shift is the redistribution of where travelers go. Definitely agree with that one. He says in the following, in the past, with what he called mass tourism, travelers limited themselves to like 50 or 100 cities. You know, everyone goes to Rome, Paris, Lisbon, London. They stay in a hotel district. Uh, they get on a double decker bus. They wait in line to get a selfie in front of a landmark. He says, I think that's going to get smaller as a percentage of travel in the future. And I think it's going to get some what displaced or at least balanced by people visiting smaller communities 
And he continues here. So Chesky said he sees potential boom for national parks, which is very, very true. I think that's going to definitely come back. And he says uh, most people haven't got gone to them. He said, and it's pretty cheap. You don't need to buy an airplane ticket. You can usually drive because most people live within 200 miles of a park. So I think you're going to start to see travel becoming more intimate, more local, smaller communities. I can even speak for myself. Like I'm, I'm one of my goals once I've once post once lockdown's over, once lockdown gets eased. One thing I'm going to get sorted out is my haircut and get my you know my braids done which I'm really looking forward to. I've been wanting to, I've been putting it off for years. But well, another thing that I'm planning to do is get my driving license, right? I'm going to take my lessons as soon as lockdown's over. That's the first thing I'm going to do. And why? Because if I want to travel within inland, I'll need a car, right? Um, if I decide to move from London, I'll need a vehicle too. So, you know, I'll need a driving license in order to hire a van. So the, the COVID has done that to me. It's made me local. It's made me kind of think, you know what? I actually need a car because I can't just rely on getting a train or getting on a plane to go travel somewhere. I need the ability to move around my area, move around my town, my locale a lot easier. And the best way to do that is with a car. So that's already shifted the way that I'm thinking about it. And lastly, it says, I think a lot of people are going to realize they don't need to get on an airplane to have a meaning. Um, I mean, meet you in the office, but now we're on Zoom. I definitely oh we have a meeting sorry yes yeah, I definitely agree with that one we've seen that already with the co-working spaces essentially dwindling and most offices allowing their employees to work from home but yeah travel will not be the same which is I don't think a bad thing I think especially if you live in the UK man like if you, if you're not able to go to a festival outside the UK it doesn't really matter the amount of festivals that we have going on here in land is going to be insane the demand for those festivals is going to be so high once COVID is over honestly especially um na yeah especially domestic um festivals I can imagine stuff like Glass and Briefs selling out five times over once lockdown's over especially if they get the same lineup they meant to have this year so um i don't know man let me know what changes your your plan to have uh, post covid what things you think have changed for the better or for the worse because of coronavirus let me know in the comments down below and i'll endeavor to get back to you next on the list here what else do we have to talk about before i leave you guys Oh, Virgil strikes again. He just can't help himself, can he? Unfortunately, um, Virgil has another oopsie on social. It seems like he's not really good at gauging the room, innit? He's not good at reading the room, Mr. Virgil. So it seems like um, he, he kind of rectified himself pretty well off the back of, you know, what? Off the back of, um, you know, uh, two Virgil's gate, right? When he inadvertently revealed that he donated fifty dollars as part of a donation chain, but it came across as if he was only donating fifty dollars, which came off the back of him criticizing protesters for looting round two, and then for the round two founder to say he doesn't really care, things can get replaced. There's a bigger message at heart, which basically made Virgil look like a bit of a coon, which I don't agree with, and also made him look like he doesn't support black businesses or black creatives, which I don't agree with either, because you just have to look at his, you know, his collaboration profile CV. He's kind of gone out of his way to hire his friends right um to get them to get them in position to allow them to travel to allow them to be um recognized as creatives legitimate right standing next to them walking a lot side by side with someone like an ian connor for instance when he's going through all his um legal issues whatever it may be you no know, he, he's a he's a, he's obviously a good dude he's, he's, a, he's a good friend in that regard right because he's got he's got a position he's got influence and he's willing to kind of exchange, he's kind of willing to kind of share out his clout coins, right? Hey, here, here, have some, have some, have some, have some. Great to see. But there's also a part of him that's a little bit annoying and rubs people up the wrong way, which you can understand, right? Is that I think most, the most important part of it from what I've been seeing, again, just from kind of being an outside observer and having some experience of having worked with him within his vicinity, not worked directly with him, right? We're not friends or anything, but being able to see how he kind of operates is that, it seems like people just don't like him because he's not good, right? Objectively, the stuff he does is people don't are not necessarily fans of it. They think his clothes are gaudy. They think he talks in riddles. Um, and he just doesn't, you know, he doesn't, I don't know. People just don't seem to be inspired by him the way they should be. Because on paper, Virgil's an amazing dude, right? Self-made guy who was essentially working as Kanye's assistant, then works his way up to be creative director, is in charge of and kind of fundamental to the creative direction and the artistic direction of some of the most important albums, single artwork, um, changed the way singles were dropped and released and all this good stuff, you know, did the whole, you know, collaborated with the with um, good music and all that good stuff artist direction stage design merch cool great stuff does his own brand that's fairly shit in pyrex vision then gets that uses that as a platform to launch into off-white a fully you know fully realized a runway collection that then gets some opportunity to design for louis vuitton like just incredible stuff right on paper like really really great 
But I guess because the work itself is set for the Nike 10 collaboration, which he hit out of the park, right? And again, he says in interviews himself, that was a very risky decision, right? Taking on the responsibility of designing 10 Nike sneakers, right? If you got one wrong, right, you're dead. Especially if you, when it comes to sneakerheads, right? Sneakerheads can be real bitchy, real finicky. So if he would have got that wrong, he would not have lived that down forever. But he got it right. He sold the entire thing out. Even, you know, the shitty designs in that collaboration, such as the MX97, they still go for good amounts of money. So, he's a, you know, there are bits and pieces that he does that are amazing. The, the yellow belt, I wore that for a long time. I thought that was a clever design piece that's been, you know, copied and plagiarized by a number of brands. So he knows what he's doing in some regard. But there are some options bits and pieces that he does where you're just reminded of like god damn it man you he really has got through he, he it seems like he's been able to progress really far in his career purely based on the amount of work he puts in and i think that's the message that needs to be reiterated people need to remember part of the reason why he's so successful is because he just works much harder than most people in that field he approaches working in the creative arts or in fashion the same way Future does or Gucci Mane does when it comes to music. I remember him saying that in an interview with Charlemagne, right? Uh, Charlemagne was kind of insinuating, oh, you put out too much stuff. And he was like, no, I don't. My fans want to always hear from me. If my fan, if people that don't want to hear from me think I'm over populate, I'm polluting their feed, they're going to tune out, but they're not my fans to begin with. So I'm going to keep giving my fans music because they also that's what they want. They want to they wanna hear from me. And the best way to hear from me is through my music. And Virgil does the same approach with fashion. He consistently Consistently, he's pushing stuff out, collaborating with everything under the sun, Evian, Ikea, Pioneer, just so he can have different pieces, that, so he can have so many, so he can have a really fully realized portfolio so that any amount of company out there can kind of see, oh shit, he can design chairs, or he can do stereo, or he can design a, a deck, he can do this, he can do that. So it kind of expounds his kind of um, opportunities in that regard. So I think it's a really clever, but in terms of, his actual ability to design things and his aesthetic, it just isn't of the time. People just don't like it. It rushes people up the wrong way, whatever it may be. Um, and another good example is this Pop Smoke cover, right? Uh, his posthumous album is meant to be coming out this Friday or this Sunday. Um, and kind of essentially they revealed the artwork for it and people on social were going crazy <laughs> over it because it's pretty terrible. Um, this is the artwork, this is the tweet. It says, um, shoot to the stars, aim for the moon, official album cover designed by Virgil Abloh. So as a story, it should be amazing because we know we all know that picture of um, Pop Smoke arriving at Paris Fashion Week. What was it, last year, right? Spring, summer season 20, 1920, whatever it was, might have been, right? Um, walking around, wearing that amazing um, off-white um, coat, right? The blue one with the market that he's got here in the picture. Um, really great, right? A seminal moment, right? A really big moment for New York hip hop, a big moment for hip hop in general. The meeting of the world, it's great to see, right? Um, so Virgil essentially got that picture, cropped it, um, and essentially added. I don't know if they're diamonds or ice in the background, similar to what he did with what a time, what a great, what a, what a time to be alive with Future and Drake, and I added these barbed wire sort of like overlays on top of it, which don't look that great either. But it's just a really poor, low effort album cover. There's no, it doesn't it just doesn't look good, right? It kind of reminds me a little bit of the West Side Gun album cover that got a lot of slack. But I guess because West Side Gun is a lot more beloved, and people kind of just want to root for him no one really kind of went to say much about the album cover but the album cover was fairly underwhelming too considering he collaborated with Virgil and he was a really he's a really big off-white fan um it would have been nicer to have seen a bit more I don't know not even I don't know designing stuff isn't just about how many layers do you have on your PSD file right it's more so about just I don't know. There's just it's just it just feel like there's more depth to it at the moment. It just doesn't feel like there's any depth to it. It just feels as if like he's just raining, he's just winging it, which is you know he might be doing, but again, I don't think that's the problem. I just think the problem is people don't like Virgil because they think he represents mediocrity, which is dangerous because he's a black dude designing in an industry that is fairly you know fairly white and he's he's probably at the high it's probably at the he's at the apex of it. He's at the top of the mountain. People should be rooting for him regardless, but they're not. Um, which is weird, right? Um, and I guess it's something that he has to kind of reconcile with, like, why don't people like me? Which is basically what's happening here. People just don't like the guy at all. Um, and even less so because somebody like a Pop Smoke, they feel is being disrespected by the album cover he put out there. So that gets released, right? The first album cover. Then then we see a t-shirt design, right? Uh, Stop the Violence t-shirt by Virgil Abloh, available now, Pop Smoke's online store. The cut of the t-shirt looks really cool, but the design again looks pretty really bad. If anything, the design on the t-shirt looks better than it does on the album cover. Um, I would probably have got rid of the diamonds and maybe the chains. And as a t-shirt, that could probably work really well as a 
sort of memorial tee, airbrushy kind of looking, but still it's fairly low brow, it's fairly shit. Stop the violence. What does that even mean? Um, Pop Smoke, you know, perished through a very violent end. Um, his lyrics were the exemplary example, yeah, were exemplary of violence. Um, in that regard, this mantra that they, they might have been able to, they might have agreed to that prior to his death, but to emblazon the t-shirt with stop the violence now just feels a bit off the mark it feels a bit tasteless it's a bit like what um it's a bit again it kind of insults our intelligence we all know how he died uh, it's not a good way to commemorate him and on the back here you've got i'll oh, shoot for the stars aim for the moon which is i think it's a good mantra to go with so that was you know again um no one really had that much reaction to it and then the official statement from steven victor um the manager of is it the manager or the guy that basically discovered pop smoke or basically gave him a deal he says um steven victor says you were always shooting for the stars about pop smoke um and aiming for the moon and everything we talked about is happening and the only thing is you're not here to in the flesh to see it all come together you wanted virgil to design your album cover and lead creative virgil designed the album cover and lead creative we love you and miss you more and more each day and then that's obviously very touching as well the official track list is out as well that we can see here in the official app on the website allow motion let's not allow the camera motion allowed can we accept it except for no let's not do that that's not going to load up let's just continue um and then a statement from Virgil said the last conversation I had with Pop Smoke was about what we were going to do in the future. This album cover was one of five things we talked about. In our mem in your memory, I just finished it yesterday as evident of the whole idea. The T-shirt insinuates it's mandatory that we put an end. We put an end to this cycle of violence that plagues us we need to shoot for the moon and aim for the stars as heavy as it as it were as as it is we are celebrating your life and the whole way through very touching message there a little bit convoluted but hey that's virtual talk and then an update from 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 uh, Stephen victor said we heard you and if you're wondering why because people are absolutely ragging it right online here's some of the the things people said um one dude here suggested that he basically made the entire album cover on his iphone and made an example to illustrate just as much from twitter he essentially got the first image of pop smoke here the original image from paris fashion week made on, on instagram sorry yeah on instagram stories there's an image here of some barbed wire that he placed on top of ends and diamonds and that's a finishing touch right he was able to make the entire cover on, on his instagram stories uh, which is fairly disheartening. And then the other comment here. Um, oh, and then um, another suggestion, which I thought was a really good suggestion, was uh, Dirtbag Phil suggested that they just use the album cover or the cover that was used, the photo shoot, sorry, that was used for the Fader interview that Pop Smoke did, which I thought was really cool. So this image is, looks amazing. This is from the Fader issue. And I think there's some more pictures here as well that we can see. Where is it? Da, 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 da. I think it was, I thought it was here. Did I not get it? Maybe I'm just saying. But yeah, that cover looks, of course, far better than the Virgil one that he designed. And then the last update, I guess, is from um, Theophilus London, who essentially spoke to Virgil and supposedly we all got it wrong. And I guess that's probably why people don't like Virgil, isn't it? It's this idea that artistically he's so ahead of the curve like it's i guess people that's the same issue people have with um kanye stands right that everything kanye does his fans sort of explain away as genius even when it's something as preposterous as a jumper covered in holes yeah everyone could kind of explain why that is worth 700 dollars. but then fans people that aren't fans are like that isn't worth 700 dollars. that's just a shit jumper with holes in it and I guess the same thing applies to Virgil, right? Um, when he gets on the phone with Theophilus London and essentially has a conversation where he kind of says, hey man, like Theophilus London tweets here, says, had a great call with the boy. Um, Y'all got it twisted and misconstrued, but moving forward, it's on 1,000. I don't know what the hell that even means, right? He took a screenshot of him talking to Virgil. Supposedly, I guess, what? Um, I don't know. Maybe that was exactly the design Pop Smoke wanted at the time, but considering what Virgil has gone through so on social media you would have just thought he would have been able to read the room better and maybe put together something a lot more substantial maybe something with a bit more reverence maybe something with a bit more weight towards it I don't know what the actual answer is but I just know it wasn't that um, and to kind of not just be humble enough to be like hey I missed the mark I didn't read the room properly I guess people wanted more um, it's just really bad isn't it but it just goes to show just disconnected this guy seems to be from because again it's weird to see with Virgil because he's always talking about the kids he's always talking about you know this sort of like social media 
um, way of designing and and kind of getting ideas from from Instagram and designing stuff on WhatsApp and being digital and internet savvy, but he seems to really miss the current climate, what's kind of going on. He doesn't necessarily understand how he's viewed or how he's even perceived. He seems to kind of have this assumption that people misunderstand him as an artist, but I think generally people get what he's doing, but they're just not fans of it. Um, I think you can see via via the clothes he makes, right? Who actually wears the clothes that he makes outside of Gunner and I don't know. And pop smoke before he unfortunately passed away no one really his friends don't even wear his own clothes he doesn't even wear his own clothes right um it seems to be a weird place he's in where he's sort of designing for people that not necessarily fan he sort of seems to be designing for people he doesn't want to design for or i don't know if that's really the case because he always talks about the high and low but he would want he would obviously want to have the likes of playboy card to be more fans of the stuff that he makes right that kind of group of class of people right but they're not necessarily wearing his stuff and he want the kind of cool woke Twitter fashion lot to be fans of his too, but they don't like him either. He'd also want the critters cool, you know, platforms such as Diet Proud to be fans of him too, but they're not fans of him either, right? And, you know, it's just, I don't know. He should be able to kind of, he needs to maybe accept the position that he has at the moment with people or how he's perceived and then maybe move accordingly or just not address it at all. I don't know what the actual answer is, but I know this isn't it. Using Fluffless London as your sort of like PR um, isn't the way to go forward with it and some people have kind of skewed that on the comments below he says um it's the first comment here replying to the image it's like oh how shitty how shit how sh how is a shitty cover misconstrued 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 um it's, it's a blatant disrespect of him using the first pick of images not to mention he took no longer than five minutes on it ain't shit misconstrued about that Fifth obviously being his best friend replies back and said it's from a video still and first off calm down it's a lot behind the scenes you know nothing about and it isn't my job to reveal but it's my job to have my own taste and stand by which is a weird statement because it's not about taste um objectively that cover is bad um, and he continues to say it's just a bad cover and something he continues to say in your opinion let it sit love let it sit as in what it can get better over time I don't agree but yeah the, the common consensus isn't good and Stephen Victor basically is skewed that and it looks like they're going to go back to the drawing board and do something else whether or not they get Virgil to redesign the cover or whether it's something that um, yeah well whether they get some to redesign it is a thing probably shouldn't be a thing maybe they should just get another designer to go and do it somebody that's maybe more tied to pop smoke maybe somebody else i don't know what the answer is or maybe virgil can use that as opportunity to kind of feel design maybe that'd be a good thing to do maybe virgil can host a contest on his instagram where he gets people to send in design propositions ideas um about what they think where how they can best represent pop smoke what works best and then he can kind of pick the winner from there or they can kind of vote on instagram so i don't know make it a bit more interactive but it looks like they're going to change it um we got the tweets here from Stephen Victor it says, um, heard you BRB making a change. He says pop smoke would have listened to his fans. So yeah, we're going to see a change to that, but it, it, it's, it's a bit sad, I guess, looking at it from the outside in. Cause again, as, as, as much as I'm not a fan of the guy personally, I still think Virgil plays an important part in, um, in terms of being a creative, especially in the, uh, especially with black people within the scene, especially in fashion in general. Um, he's just a good person to have in that position because he's able to play politics. He's able to be, you know, a little bit middle of the road in terms of his appeal. Um, and I also just think it's good for motivation, inspiration purposes for kids to see someone like a Virgil designing on that level. I think it's going to be an inspiration and a chance for people to push forward. But God damn it, man. He seems to be missing the mark a lot in it. But hey, what can you do? Anyway, that's actually doing show episode number 334. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you're first time listening, of course, make sure you hit subscribe, hit smash that like button. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, give me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. Until next time, friends, see you very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Bye.